not even gonna like go into a, like a deep intro. Mo, what was your impressions on AEW Double or Nothing? Hot steaming garbage. Um, minus the ending. <sighs> Tony should be ashamed of himself, and I feel sorry for everyone that bought a ticket. But at the same time, that was the, the most sleepiest crowd I had ever seen. Like, y'all was tired the entire time. The entire time. Like, I understand the show was a little slow. Not a little. It was very slow. But, like, the part that was so good, y'all did not wake up for me. Mm. And it's so crazy because Double or Nothing is, like, the SummerSlam equivalent. Right, and yeah. it just didn't feel like a sh- like a show or a spectacle. First and foremost, can we end battle royals? Can we end them? What is the point? What do you gain out of winning a battle royal? Is it like an annual showcasing? I can't even say it's an annual showcasing for wrestlers that are that are on payroll that are not utilized. Because why was Jay White and Ricky Starks in there? Like I was so pissed off that I just when I saw that they were in there, I was just so mad. I started just fast forwarding. Like there were some interesting spots, but it's just like it's so meaningless. It's so pointless. Again, you don't have to have a bajillion matches on the card if they're not going to be quality. Like look what. WWE did with the main roster and NXT. They definitely didn't have nine matches. I think it was six and five or something like that. But you remember all of them. The only thing that was like rememberable for me, uh, let's start off with Max Caster. Because that rap, (laughs) that rap was a jaw dropper. What? He came out swinging. Swinging. Okay. He came for Malachi Black and said that he was doing blackface. I was like, oh my God, I didn't even peep that. Like, then he followed up with coming at Buddy. We already knew that like he, he feels some type of way about Rhea, right? Because we've seen, we've seen that, oh, that deleted Instagram comment with Dom pointing at her ass and whatnot. But he goes ahead and says that he's getting cucked by a kid named Dom. Dominant. I was like, literally, that was me the entire, like, when that line came up, I was like, oh, nah. And you know this man is still pressed because he still followed up on Twitter about how, like, he got him over into company or something like that. Like, boy, bye, you're mad. (laughs) Like, you're Mm -hmm. so mad right now. He had him pressed. Like, I couldn't couldn't even focus. I was focusing on the match. Yes, but I couldn't almost focus on the match. I was just like, oh, my God. Like, he could not have gotten away with this shit on on, on regular TV. Like, he he waited. He had this ready and written from the moment he saw the Instagram post. Because he knew he couldn't say those two lines. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That was crazy. That was definitely crazy. But the match was fun. I still find Anthony Bowen a national treasure. I thought it was so funny when he did the whole um, sitting in, in, in a pretzel style and just taunted at um, Malachi. Like, I could pretzel style too, basically. Like, who are you, bitch? Like, <laughs> that shit was mad funny to me. He was like, to me, he was like my biggest takeaway of the entire night. Just like Max Caster's rap. Not the entire night. Oh, that match. Max Caster and Anthony Bowens. I'm just going to stop right there and ask you how'd you feel about that match or that moment with Max. I like I like the match. I think that I, you know what it was? Cause they announced, it was like, ah, oh, it's an open house match. It's an open challenge. Yeah. I expected a non AEW team to come out. But when the acclaim came out, I was like, all right, I'm cool with the acclaim. And then when the rap happened, I was just, oof. that was rough. <laughs> I mean, like, I just be feeling so bad for buddy because like, it seems like every time this man is in partnership with someone somebody is just trying it with alexa bliss it was the entire internet oh and yeah then now with Rhea, it just and with with, with with alexa it was the entire internet plus half the locker room then when it's Rhea, it's like oh well she just so happens to be in her sex symbol era and it's just like damn buddy like you can't get <laughs> a break bro <laughs> you cannot catch a break and i feel That's so hard. bad for him but I think it was a good match. Like, obviously, I'm just really, really glad that, like, Malachi Black is getting his just due and he's getting highlighted as a performer because he was someone who I felt like on the main roster in WWE, he was, like, underutilized. Um, But But have they been doing anything with the House of Black? 
I mean, with the trios championships, yeah. I mean, like, they've been on TV regularly. They've been defending the championships regularly. They've been featured prominently. So it's like they have been doing stuff. I would I would say more than what was done in WWE. They're but what's the story with stuff. them? Like, I, I don't understand, like, what... So, how they came together? So, I mean... How first, they came together, was, I understand. But, like, what's their purpose moving forward? Because they acquired Julia, I mean, and then what? <laughs> and then, like, I mean, like, I think their just goal is to just be a faction to just kick ass. I mean, like, and to win gold. I mean, like, that's pretty much the goal of every faction in, in AEW is just, like, we're just going to wow out and win as much as we can and accumulate wins and accumulate championships. Like... I think that the way that they came together was so intriguing and then it got us hooked and then seeing Julia's character transformation from being the pop, like the super, super preppy cheerleader into like this dark, ominous girl. And if you watch her matches, like when she, when dark was a thing in dark elevation, she just became a more intriguing character. So it's like, okay, now we have something here and they have championships and they've been featured prominently. So okay. I definitely... I definitely like where they're going with them. Did you okay. watch uh, Adam Cole versus Chris Jericho? Jesus Christ. Do we have to talk about this? <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, Jesus we Christ. Oh, my God. Uh, I was so pissed off because it was so underwhelming. It was between Jericho's slow old man, just bone cracking arthritis built wrestling. Um, he looked it terrible. And then Adam Cole... He's not helping the painfully small comments when he wrestles like he's painfully small. By that, I mean this. Okay, we're going to get into this match later. But Darby Allen is also one of the most tiniest people on that roster, right? But, like, when Darby Allen wrestles, he wrestles with ferocity and the velocity. He looks like a threat. He looks like he could hold his own. Adam Cole, why are you, like, maybe he has an injury or something that he's healing from, I don't know, but, like, he was delicate the entire time. Now, you can't cut a promo talking about how I'm going to end your career, and you're throwing these little sissy punches and these sissy throws, like, if you don't want to take a bump because you're probably injured, all right, I get that, but when you're throwing strikes, there's no excuse as to why you can't lay it on them. I see Naomi lay harder strikes. The ending pissed me off because he's like, mm, mm. the slow motion, like not effective hits that was supposed to put Jericho out. And it, it was just corny to me. It gave me the type of like ick that I got when I watched the fiend and, um, um, the fiend and, Seth and Seth Rollins. Cause like, what was the match name again? The, 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 the match. Was the, it was the, it was a hell in a cell, but it was like the red hell in a cell. No, I'm talking about this match. This match. The match type. Unsanctioned. It was unsanctioned. So why is it being called off because he's getting punched relentlessly? Like, it was... It's not kind of like an, an, an equivalence of kind of like, you know, a DQ match, a no DQ match. Like, yeah. I just thought it was just a weird ending, especially when, again, there's no ferocity behind the hits. It just made me think to myself that Chris Jericho... Don't, doesn't need to like not be involved in wrestling, but I think that it's time that he packs it up as a wrestler. I think he's still valuable, and I appreciate everything that he's done for the company. I mean, for Warren, for him, I don't think anyone had paid attention to AEW to begin with. You know, like he he was needed to hold the belt in the first place, and he's put a lot of talents over. But I feel like it's his time to sit back and try to help put talents over without being in a match with them like he's a good talker too i mean duh the man has a podcast guys freaking done media has his own band why can't he do like a talking role where instead of having a faction where everyone's following behind him why can't he just like talk for someone or stand beside someone instead of standing in front of someone like he can still be usable you know and to help get someone's character over because i don't think that with the jerk appreciation squad or whatever the hell that he calls it society um, I don't think he's really gotten the people behind him really over. They're just like, it's there at this point. But why can't he just get like other people over, you know, in an indirect way? This, to me, I thought the match was underwhelming. I think that Jericho just needs to just do something else. What do you think? 
I agree that the match was super underwhelming. I feel like it could have been a lot better. Um, I thought it was hilarious that Sabu came out, went through his one table, and then went home. He literally got out, set up the oh, music, make this quick. We're going to make this quick. I'm going to get this table. I'm going to go through it. I'm going to get up, and we're going to go home. Um, so there was that aspect. I think another big thing that I kind of was paying attention to, I don't think that it was a matter of like – Jericho needing to hang it up. I feel like he has some valuable years left in him. However, I do just think that if we're going to do an unsanctioned match, we shouldn't we shouldn't have an unsanctioned finish. And like we need to really bring it. I feel like Adam like and rightfully so, this is probably the most extreme um physical contact he's been involved with since returning from injury and according to, you know, all access and all these things, that injury was pretty serious. But like if 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 the, the whole idea is like, ah, well, it, we don't know, like, how brutal we can be because any bump can be his last. A, a, a one-on-one wrestling match could have sufficed, in my opinion, because I believe that Cole is a great wrestler as well as Jericho. But I feel like when you say, oh, it's going to be an unsanctioned match and we have John Moxley bleeding just because the standard is really high. You know what I mean? So I feel like uh, uh, I feel like because of like the fact that there was an unsanctioned match label attached to it, it kind of set the bar and the expectations really high. And thus, because thus making the match feel underwhelming. Um, however, I feel like this isn't over. I feel like more people are going to get involved. Um, but as far as the match is concerned, I, I didn't really, I wasn't the biggest fan of it. Um, so there's that to kind of touch on your point earlier about the battle Royal, I think that that match should have been three or four people. Like it should have been like a three way or, or a four way, not a four way. Cause I don't want it to compete with the three pillars, but it, it was, it really boiled down to, to three people. I think it should have been orange Cassidy, Jay white and somebody else. But I, the, the battle Royal, I think, Oh, and swerve. Um, I thought he was in there. Actually, him no. and Keith Lee was in there too. Yeah. Yeah. Him and Keith Lee was in there too. I, I feel like it should have been swerve. Actually, no, I take that back. It should have been Swerve, Ricky, and Orange Cassidy. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that they needed to do a battle royal with that. Um, the tag team match with FTR versus Jeff Jarrett and, and uh, Jay Lethal was actually pretty entertaining. Yeah. Um, I didn't care for but it. But I wanted to specifically focus on the last two matches, though, which is the Four Pillars match and the, uh, and the Anarchy in the Arena. Wait, we can't do that. Like- we can't do that without mentioning Jade. Jade, Jade, my bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about that. Talk first of all. Can we talk about the entrance? Yes, yes. Okay, I love that so much. Oh my god, she um was uh paid homage to her sorority, which I believe was um the first African American um sorority in what location? I, hold on, I gotta check it, but keep going though while I. Well, it was iconic, all right. Um, <laughs> we said this in the group chat, but one thing we love about Miss Jade is that she's going to come in unapologetically black, and she came out with um the the singer to this TikTok song. Um, what, what was that song called? It was it was walk like this. Yeah, I thought it was so cute. The little stepping was cute. The ring gear was cute. Everyone looked so happy to be there. And then they passed her her belt. She came in there looking like a star. Um, and then she had her match with Taya. Um, and I'm be honest, like I'm not really a big fan of of, of um Taya Valkyrie. I'm really not. But I thought the belt was gonna go to her because similar to Bianca, um, I. This thought the rain was going on for too long. Um, and then Jay retained, and then it threw me off. I'm like, okay. But then we got hit with a with a little swerve again. Both both our black female champions uh, got hit with swerves because we had a return. When we had a return of Chris Statlander, which I'm not sure about you guys, but I was excited. I was most definitely excited because she was someone who I wasn't even thinking about was a possible option considering she was out for like nine, 10 months with an injury. But I thought the booking was actually good in spite of the fact that a lot of people think that it was fucked up. 
I think that it worked because even though I don't like Tay Valkyrie, she's a legitimate wrestler. Um, and she, she weakened Jade and Chris came out pretty much just like blindsiding her while she, again, was just like beaten down and weakened. Um, I feel like Chris should have got a bigger pop for her return. Um, she looked great, by the way. Love her look. But, you know, she came in, she wrapped it up, and she took the belt. And I thought it was brilliant because one thing about Chris is that, like, despite the fact that this crowd wasn't loud enough for me, everywhere else that she goes, anytime she's making a return from her injuries, she always comes back with such, like, just, like, a, 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 just a warm welcoming from the audience. Like, she just oozes just pure baby face. And I don't think that if it was another crowd, definitely they would have made way more noise for her victory because like she is, again, she, she is such a natural baby face. She's a legitimate wrestler. Um, you know, I, I feel like she should have gotten an opportunity sooner had she not been out of action constantly. And I know people are just like upset. They're like, Oh, well there's a whole roster of females that, you know, they could have been utilizing why they give to someone who just got here. That's unfair. I don't think anyone says built up as Chris, in my personal opinion. Um, I think every other female kind of has work to do. Like we like Anna J, for example, but Anna J, like she, she has her, uh, she has some good matches, but she has a lot of like, not, not, not that many good matches. You know what I mean? We thought Kiara Hogan would be great because Kiara Hogan is a good wrestler, but she doesn't really have like that charisma that i think we're looking for um but chris kind of has all that and she's gonna give us that shake up that like i said that uh, connor also is gonna give i feel like she's gonna give that here you know um and plus jay won some time off so i feel like if she, it probably was a decision she agreed upon as well that all right let's give it to chris you know she worked very hard even though she hasn't been around like i mean she busted her ass trying to get there you feel me so I was actually pretty happy with the decision. But what do you feel about Jade's entrance and Chris Statlander's win? So first things first, we got to shout out Jade. Shout out to all the AKAs. Um, so to give a little bit of context, Alpha Kappa Alpha is the first African-American uh, sorority. It was founded in 1908. It was founded on the campus of Howard University. And what was happening was during that entrance, she was doing her stroll. And if you know anything about historically black uh, fraternities and sororities, everybody has their own stroll. And so the stroll is very unique to the identity of every single uh, fraternity and or sorority. Omega Sci Fi has their own. The Kappa's got their own. The AKA's got their own. The Delta's got their own. Um betas i believe they have their own so like everybody kind of has their own stroll uh the mm. alphas they have their own so everybody kind of has their own stroll and so for her to do the stroll of the first black or do a stroll representing the first black sorority i think is very very big for the culture and i don't think that that's talked about as heavy as it should be mostly because the people who are consuming wrestling don't understand the historical significance of that um, so the fact that she was able to one do that on TV as an entrance and two have that gear, that pink and green gear, and those that pink and that green is are aka colors. So the pink and the green, that's aka. Um, so for her to be able to represent her sorority the way that she did, represent the culture the way that she did, that was big. And I don't think that people are gonna digest that and appreciate that until 20 30 years from now when we have a larger black fan base in wrestling so that's that i think that the jade taya valkyrie match was pretty solid i could have sworn that taya was going to win but i was surprised when she didn't um but i was very very happy that chris statlander was the one that came back and ended the streak i felt like it was appropriate i felt like it was time um and Chris Statlander, to kind of build on what you're saying, is a natural babyface. People love Chris. People love Chris. People were rooting for her throughout her recovery. And I feel like, once again, um, had that been a different city, she probably would have gotten a bigger reception, which I think brings me to this point. And I was going to wait to the end to say it, but I'm going to say it now. I don't think Las Vegas is a wrestling crowd. 
I don't think that Las Vegas is a wrestling crowd. Nope. Las Vegas is a combat sports crowd. It's an MMA crowd. It's a boxing crowd, but it is not a wrestling crowd. And what had happened was I feel like they based their, um, their you know, commitment to doing these Las Vegas shows based on the first two years of Double or Nothing. But in reality, what was happening was I feel like a lot of people were flying from out of town. And they were coming to the, this AEW pay-per-view because either AEW had not been to their town yet or two, because it was new and you wanted to be a part of the AEW experience in Vegas. Because I think that Vegas and Chicago are, in my opinion, the two big AEW cities because you have double or nothing in one and you have all in and the other. And so I think that in addition to the fact that it is, it wasn't necessarily the most exciting show, the market is burnt to the ground because they've been exposed to so many wrestling shows and MMA shows and boxing shows in the past year that it's just like, I feel like people are tired, not necessarily of AEW, but just the market is so, just so oversaturated and there's so much happening that it's easy to get bored and it's easy to get tired. So there is that. That was my little impression on the, on the Jade match. Um, on to the four pillars match. Wanted to know your opinion on that, on on your takeaways from that match and, and so forth. Uh, I think that was the best match of the night. And, um, okay, I want to backtrack. I love the fact that while they did um, their announcement between Sammy and um, Tay Conti for having a baby... Um, and at first I was annoyed and it was the eye roll. Not that, you know, that they're having a baby, but I'm like, all right, why are you doing this shit here? You know, so I mean, I'm like, why are they copying Miz and Marie's? That's my, that was my first thought. I'm and, weak. No, for real. That was my first thought. But then, unlike the E, they actually took that and they incorporated it into the match um, and adding uh, character development, which was fucking amazing because my pick going in was Sammy just because they put Sammy out to be like this un- uh, this, this undying baby face or whatnot. And I believe we said in our last predictions, uh, as Jordan said, that, um, you know, MJF is going to watch them all do their flippy shit. And then MJF is going to be an opportunist, more or less, and get the pin there. But they went about it utilizing the news. It was pretty awesome. Um, I think everyone went out there looking great. Of course, we we didn't think it was going to go to Darby or to Jungle Boy, but they still looked amazing. They still showed out. As I said previously, Darby Allen's so tiny, but like he like he looks and is reckless. Like he looks scary. I wouldn't want to mess with him. I really wouldn't. Um, But they all looked it good, and I liked how um, so much of my my um, feedback on the triple threat for NXT. I like the fact that all faces were pretty much in the ring at almost all times until they need to tell a story. And part of the story was, yeah, Sammy's a dad now. So, dude, what are you doing away from your kid and your pregnant wife? Like, you're a, you're, you're supposed to be a baby face, but you're going to be a terrible person if you just go to work <laughs> and you, right. you, try to, you try to collect this extra money and spend more, spend even more time away from your family. Like you, you should just give it up and just be a dad, man. And it made Sammy, despite the fact that how we feel about him as a person, it made him an even more undying baby face. So we felt bad for him because right. MJF's like, "Yo, lay down, just take your L's, go home." Like and you're gonna give us this announcement, and then you're just gonna be selfish. How dare you? You know what I mean? Right. It was such good shit because it's such an MJF thing to do to be manipulative. Literally. Because he was about to eat that pin, and he knew yeah, that. He, he just stopped everything, took it to the middle, like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're a shitty person. You think I'm a shitty person? You're a shitty person. <laughs> like, right. Sammy was damn near ready to lay down and take the pin. But, of course, Sammy faked it. And then we got this wonderful ending using this uh, using the daredevil that uh, Darby Allen is with his coffin drop. We always, always comment on the fact that you can't see where you're going with that move. So it's bound that you're going to hit your head at some point. And I loved how that was the ending. They use logic. And MJF being this, the asshole opportunist he is, takes the belt that he's going to retain anyways, lay it down and let him smash his head into it and then collect the pin. 
I love that. I popped out. I'm like, oh, this is good. He's just too good. All right. He deserved that retain. That was a good match. Everyone looked in good. The desperation was there the entire fucking time. Again, the whole match was logical. Logical. Like, yes. another thing that I loved was how desperate everyone was watching everyone else to make sure, you know, I, I'll be damned if you tap. Like, they broke out submission logs to make sure the other person didn't tap. There was this cool-ass, like, moment where they were, like, in Boston Crabs or something, and even when they were all in a, a the the... A human centipede version of a figure for a leg lock and a lock. And everyone was like, human centipede. Yeah, everyone was like watching each other, like, you better not tap. You bet this is mine. Like, I'd be damned. I'd be damned. Like, I if loved I let it. You get this right. Everyone was so desperate the entire time. Like, it that was the match that woke me up for the entire night. To me, if that match ended the show and we just clipped out the last match, I would have been satisfied. Like, that best fucking match of the night. Everyone looked amazing. What was your take, Jordan? So, not only did they use logic and not only did the, the belt get slid in, so they put the belt on Jungle Boy and Darby hit his, you know, hit hit his head. Not hit his head, I think hit his back. And then, what did MJF do before the pin? The headlock takeover. And they had been talking about that all feud long. I beat you with a headlock takeover. I beat you with a headlock takeover. I beat you with a headlock. So the fact that MJF ended it with a headlock takeover into the pen, genius. Yeah. Also, the fact that all four people were involved in the finish of the match. You had Jungle Boy, who had just been hit with a coffin drop with a belt put on top of him, right? But he wasn't pinned. You had Darby being pinned, taking the clean pen after a headlock takeover. You had Sammy frantically trying to get into the ring to break up the pen. And so you can tell a story from each of those points. You can tell a story from MJF's point of being a, an opportunist. Darby kind of like being so close until MJF did some MJF stuff. You can see Jungle Boy as like, you can see Jungle Boy as like the guy who, you know, ultimately, even though he wasn't pinned, right was the guy who kind of like ended the chances for everyone else and then you could see sammy you know come from the place of like i wasn't even in the ring you didn't even pin me how are you going to say that you beat me da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. so there's so many stories that can go from that point but i think that four-way was just fantastic everyone looked great when everyone broke out their mentors finishing move i popped between the between Jungle Boy using the unprettier, MJF doing the crossroads. Uh, uh, um, I think Darby did both the, the Scorpion Deathlock as well as the um, the little drop, Scorpion Death drop. Um, I popped for it all. And then obviously the Code Breaker. And I think when they did a Boston Crab, Sammy did the Waltz Jericho. Yeah. So like everybody using their their the, their mentors finishing move, I just think was just absolutely excellent. It was great storytelling. Um, so I, I was I was a fan of that match for sure as well. But moving on to Anarchy in the Arena, <sighs> that was a heavy match. I but here's the the one thing that was questionable was the blackface of the the singer for the BCC. I don't know. I don't know what that was. I don't know what that man had on his face. Somebody would say it's half mask, half paint. Why are you wearing blackface while singing Wild Thing? There's no reason. There is no reason. But going from that, I think that was a really good match as well. And the ending of the match was really, really captivating with Takeshita and Don Callis. Um, and it just left it very, very open-ended. Like, is, is Takeshita... And Don Callis, a part of the Blackpool Combat Club now. Um, apparently, after the match, Kenny said something along the lines. Oh, that exploding super kick? Oh, oh my God. Yeah. Was insane. Uh, but the the whole Kenny after the match, and it was off the air, he said that he had two non-AEW friends that were going to be willing to, to help him out. And who can those people be? Who can those people be? Is it Okada and Koda? Is it like there's so many people that they can turn to for this. But I thought that was a really, really good match as well. It was super, super violent. But I wanted to know your impressions on Anarchy in the Arena. I honestly wasn't really over the moon about it the way mm. you probably were. Just because um, it was just... It was just a bunch of random and chaoticness. Um, 
it wasn't like it was a a bad match. It just kind of seemed like this is like a regular thing that AEW does. I think because they've done it so often. The only thing that was like you know kind of cool to me is the idea of, of like beating someone's ass to you know John Moxley's theme song. That's pretty awesome to me. <laughs> um, right. They probably had a lot of fun with that. Like it, it popped off to me in the beginning, and yeah, I did pop for when you know the singer got kicked in the face. Because yeah, why are you doing blackface? But I just kind of felt like I'm a little desensitized um, to these type of matches because it happens. I want to say almost every double or nothing, or at least like once, at least one of the pay per views has one of these chaotic matches. Where, you know, it's it's just messy and gimmicky and it's just something I feel like it's more exciting if you're in there and you're in the crowd because you have an opportunity to see these men up close. But I feel like as a viewer, I'm just like, okay, like, you know, you guys kind of do this stuff often now. So it's not as like exciting as it was the first or second year. So I was just like kind of waiting for the ending to see how this was going to unravel. And like I said, um, just five minutes ago, I would have been fine if they just closed off with the pillar match and this mm. was saved for maybe like, I don't know, maybe it was like saved for like the next dynamite or something. I just wasn't really excited. But then again, the show was so long that maybe I just felt like gassed Real by tired. it. Yeah. yeah, like it wasn't bad. It's just that I just wasn't excited by the end of it. I, I didn't. It didn't wake me up the way that last match woke me up. It was just like, yeah. all right, like can we just wrap this up already, Tony? He needs to work on that. <laughs> but I think that's about it for Double or Nothing. But we want to know your opinions on Double or Nothing. Leave a comment below. Um, but we're gonna get right into the last two topics, and I swear we're gonna get out of your hair because this God, this is a long show. So, 